Before we turn to the main matter of this lecture, Pictorial Woodblock Printing in China, I want to do a kind of preface describing some of the background of this practice, the tools and the materials that were used in writing and painting in China, related practices such as ink rubbings, and the kinds of woodblock printed pictures that I won't be talking about in the main lecture, but want to mention briefly here to dispose of, so to speak. Well, to begin with, on the screen now, in a slide made from an old uh, display case in the Freer Gallery, which we had for educating the public, Chinese brushes. I described how they're made in our first PRV, Pure Remote View Lecture, and I won't repeat that now. And I showed uh, the illustration from Jerome Silbergelt's book on Chinese painting style, which is now also on. Um, different brushes, as I said then, were used for different purposes, uh, writing, painting, and within painting, uh, brushes especially good for line and washes, rough brushes for broken strokes and so on. But a good artist uh, can do a lot of things with a single brush, using them uh, with great versatility, as I've watched them do many times. Next, please. Ink sticks, again, a Freer Gallery um, a display case. Uh, on the left, a water container from which you would put a bit of water onto the ink stone, and then you would rub that water, rub it up onto the main surface from a little pool at the end um, with an ink stick, and the rubbing of the ink stick against the ink stone with water made Chinese ink. Um, the stone itself was, the stones could be highly prized uh, and very, very valuable. They were made from the stone had to be of a very special kind, and there were places where the stone was uh, particularly value, valued for this. A place called Duanqi, or Japanese Tangke in Guangzhou province, for, uh, so on. And the markings in the stone, and so on. But um, um, also, uh, the, the stone itself was important, but also the carving of them, uh, sometimes with decorative designs or inscriptions. The stone, particularly, had to be of just the right hardness, uh, so that when it was polished smooth, it would still have enough surface or bite to grind off the ink as the ink stick is rubbed against the stone, as I say, with water. And what was this ink? So I now turn to that question, showing first, first please. Here is the cover of our catalog of our exhibition, uh, 1981 of Anhui School Painting, titled Shadows of Mount Huang. I did it with a seminar of eight students, terrific people, including Ginger Xu and Judy Andrews, Hiro Kobayashi, others. I divided them, divided them up into four groups, and I gave them uh, topics for related essays, which were printed in the catalog. And they included such things as the topography of the area and how that related to the paintings, of course, uh, how the making of um, uh, how, uh, how the making of ink was one of the topics, ink and ink stones, as I remember, and um, about how the styles of Anhui school painting uh, responded to the wants and needs of the rich members of the on, of the uh, famous Anhui or Huizhou merchants, who were there just then thriving. That is an economic argument about how painting styles related to economic conditions. That was absolutely a first. It hadn't been done, and we were doing it. Next, please. And in this um, project, very important project, we enjoyed the participation of Fred Wakeman, Frederick Wakeman of our history department, and his students, uh, the late Fred Wakeman, I'm, I'm very sorry to say. He died some years ago. Um, anyway, it was a topic that was close to their own interests, and they helped us. Uh, the ex <coughs> the exhibition was shown also at uh, one East Coast institution. I don't remember which; it's offhand. But the um, show and its catalog uh, aroused a lot of favorable comment. For instance, by Jonathan Spence, the famous Chinese historian at Yale, uh, for its innovative approaches. Nothing of the kind, as I say, had been accomplished before. Another of the chapters was about the making of ink and ink stones in Anhui province. In that chapter, we produced a few ink stones and discussed the making of ink in places like Huizhou in southern Anhui, 
which was a center of that production. Next, please. The two people at the left on this photo, which also includes Howard and Marianne Rogers and myself, are Joseph McDermott and his wife Hiroko. He's an historian of China and a good friend. She's an art historian specializing in Japanese art. She's written about the imperial household collection there. Um, he's been for many years now the, at uh, Cambridge University in, in England. Joe and Hiroko spent a year in Hefei, in Anhui province, in the early 1980s, and he took along copies of our Shadows of Mount Huang exhibition catalog to give to people there as gifts. And they caused quite a sensation. The news that this foreign group had brought together an exhibition of their local school of painting, which they themselves hadn't paid much attention to up to then, and the outcome in 1984 was a major exhibition of Shinan Pai, or Anhui School, uh, painting, uh, also called Huangshan School, anyway. And an international symposium on this was held in Hefei, the first international symposium on painting to be held in China. I'll talk about that symposium and my own haha, bombshell of a paper delivered the first night in another lecture. Uh, that's, that's an interesting subject, but not, not now. Next. Let me just say for now that after the symposium, we were all taken off on a tour of famous places in southern Anhui, including visits to such historic sites as the tomb of Hongran, the great artist, and a climb of Huangshan, or Mount Huang. That was the second time for me, but still a great experience. Uh, a group of peaks, of course, and, well, I won't talk about that. I've shown it many times. Well, here's a photo, of which I, a photo I've shown before, of the group of us who did the climbing, uh, or excuse me, who did the traveling after the after the symposium, with Dick Edwards and Wang Shi Cheng, Wang Shi Cheng um, famous scholar who was there, uh, in the front row. We were also taken to visit next, please, to visit an ink making factory. I believe it was in Huizhou, southern Anhui province, uh, where we watched the making of ink sticks and cakes and had the materials and the process of their making explained to us. Um, ink is made from the soot, soot, a soot which you gather by burning wood, uh, or sometimes oil. Oil can be used. But they say that the pine trees from Huangshan are particularly fine for this. At any rate, there's a whole mythology and knowledge of, about uh, the making of ink. Uh, the design and the decoration of the ink cakes and the ink sticks is also very uh, important. And here you see people, including a young girl, uh, painting or putting a gold designs on them. They became minor works of art of themselves, and famous artists sometimes contributed designs for them. We're going to see examples later in this lecture when I'll talk about two famous late Ming books that were issued by makers of ink with woodblock pictures of their products. Next, please. After the tour of the ink making factory, we were given a demonstration of the use of ink for calligraphy by one of our group. This, of course, was nothing new to most of us, at least. I have photos, and I should have made films, of noted artists painting also using ink, which I'll show quickly just to show, so to speak, what it looks like. Here, just to show a few of them, are my friend and recent Shanghai artist Chung Shi Fa, uh, and next, the late... Wang Ji Chen, or Si Si Wang, who is an important painter but never strong as a calligrapher. Next, please. And Zhang Da Chen, who was endlessly versatile, capable of painting in all the styles there were, <laughs> and of various kinds of writing as well. Although he's said to have employed other people, including one of his wives, to do the calligraphy on his fake paintings, his famous forgeries. Next. Toward the end of our first lecture in the Pure and Remote View section, or series rather, I showed this small painting on silk dating from around the 3rd century BC and found in a tomb in Changsha. And I talked about the line made by the brush as the basis for a great deal of Chinese painting. So I won't repeat all that here. Uh, we're talking rather about technical and material matters for now. Next. Another practice closely related to painting is the Chinese use of personal seals. Um, 
they are carved in a soft stone, uh, in reverse, of course, and then patted against a pad which holds the seal pigment. Uh, fine ground red pigment, vermilion or some other pigment, in an oil base. And then they are impressed uh, against the paper or the silk. Here is a, 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 another of the Freer Gallery exhibits showing the little dish of seal pigment and then the seal stone itself with the carving, carved side showing and then an impression of that seal. Now, they used to be used and maybe still are used in place of signatures to place on documents as indications of ownership or approval. We had something like the use of seals on our own culture, although not nearly so developed in the West, with our old practice of sending uh, sealing documents with wax into which a seal would sometimes be, would be impressed. And the documents were then said to be signed and sealed, a phrase we still use. Uh, seals in China are made, as I say, of a soft stone, which can be carved with designs, usually characters, in, in reverse, of course, and archaic characters, which are particularly suited to, uh, to this kind of carving and design, and rather hard to read sometimes. That's a special study in itself. Carving the seals is another high skill or art. People can be famous for it in China. I once had the equipment and tried seal carving myself in my own amateurish way, but it was, it was instructive and lots of fun. Next, please. Those of you who watched our first lectures um, in the first series became very conscious of the seals that were applied to the paintings by the artist and by subsequent art owners and by people who saw the painting sometimes. And I talked about these several times. This is the famous painting possibly by the Tang artist Han Gan, in any case very old and important, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, with a lot of seals and inscriptions covering the areas around the painting, the painting proper, the horse, the te tethered horse. Um, these seals and inscriptions may very well be visually bothersome for foreign viewers, but they greatly enhance the experience of looking at the painting for educated Chinese viewers who were practiced in seeing the painting through the sc screen of seals, so to speak. I used to compare this to listening to music on scratchy old 78 RPM records because one developed an ear that somehow filtered out the scratching sound going to hear the music through it. Next. In the late 1930s, the German scholar Victoria Kontag, while she was in Shanghai, uh, collaborated with Wang Chen to produce their famous seal book, which all of us in the field used to refer to as Kontag and Wang. They went around with a, uh, the great collectors and museums with a fingerprint camera, photographing these seals of artists and collectors, and they used them to uh, compile this invaluable book, which was several times reprinted. I wrote a new preface for one of the reprints done in Hong Kong at the request of my friend C.C. Wong. Uh, Wong always cautioned people, by the way, against using the book to compare the genuine seals in it with those on the painting that one owns or is thinking of buying. In other words, you can't match up the seals to tell whether your painting is genuine or not. Uh, Wong pointed out that for various reasons, this doesn't work, and it's as likely to mislead as to clarify the authenticity of the painting. But that's another subject too big to, 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 going to go into here. Next. The older man at right in this photo is Christer von der Berg, founder and owner of the Muban Foundation, a research foundation and collection located in London that collects and studies Chinese woodblock printed materials. Muban means woodblock. Long ago, Christer and the bibliographer of Chinese books, Søren Edgren, together started the book business called Han Chan Tang, which still flourishes under other management long after they sold it. Han Chan Tang and the Muban Foundation are located side by side in a courtyard in London, at a place far distant from the city center. Uh, seen with Christer here is the artist Xu Bing, whom I know well and whom I'll talk about in another lecture. Next. Now for a while, I'll speak about the types of pictorial printing that I'm not going to be talking about and showing uh, in the lecture that follows. 
which will be devoted to what I take to be fine art prints without clear practical function. And I'll admit freely that my definition of that is somewhat loose and arbitrary. I won't be showing, with a single exception or two, prints illustrating drama or novels. Here, one from the Xixiang Ji, or the story of the West Chamber, in which scholar Zhang, seen through a window in the lower right, dreams of his love, Chui Yingying, who appears sleeping in the upper left. We will, however, see a series of Xixiang Ji Xixiang Ji illustrations that rise far above the usual level of illustrations to become masterworks of printmaking in themselves. Next. Here is one of the many woodblock printed illustrations to Jinping Mei, the Plum in the Golden Vase, the great late Ming novel, erotic novel among other things. The anti-hero, Shi Man Ching, visits a certain woman and a scene here with her and her servants in the entryway to her home, to her house. I made copies of prints of this kind to use in lecturing. Here, for instance, about how scroll paintings were displayed in Chinese houses. You'll find this series of 100 woodblock printed illustrations, one for each chapter of this great novel, printed with the multi-volume translation that's being made and published by David Roy, of the University of Chicago. Next. An important category of picture books in China are those that preserve and convey for the use of artists and others the compositions of old paintings or figure groups and other details from them. These were produced in some number, especially in the late Ming period. I show a page from one of them in which a court lady is seen bathing a baby, holding its nose as she's about to dunk it under the water. This detail appears in quite a few old and later paintings, endlessly copied and recopied. The one I'm showing in the, uh, at the right is uh, one of a well-known pair of fan paintings in the Freer Gallery of Art, attributed to Zhou Anju, but a meaningless attribution. Um, closer related to these are books with woodblock printed pictures intended to offer instruction on how to paint using old models. Quite a number of these also were printed in the late Ming, and I'll show leaves from one of them later in this lecture. Next, please. My younger friend J.P. Park, who teaches at the University of Colorado in Boulder, has published an important book on these based on his doctoral dissertation at the University of Michigan. He's now working on a similar book about Japanese instructional picture books, and he spent several days in Berkeley recently staying with me and going through my old collection of gafu, or Japanese woodblock printed picture books. Uh, we'll have a separate lecture on these, uh, which I've collected passionately for many years. Next. This is a print by the 19th century artist Ron Chung, an illustration to a book, uh, still within the category of what will not be treated in the lecture that follows. I copied a lot of these for use in my Getty lectures given at USC on images of women in later Chinese painting. These two will make up a long uh, lecture in the future, but won't be treated here. Next. I'm also leaving out of this lecture the large category of popular prints, uh, Nianhua, or so-called New Year's prints, Suzhou prints, uh, the products of a number of important local schools of production of prints, usually colored, devoted to popular subjects, for sale at low prices, for display on the walls and the doors of common people's homes in China. These make up a large and very interesting topic within the area of folk art that is really beyond our present purpose. Ellen Lang, Ellen Johnson Lang, has published a book about these, and there are quite a few others, and uh, volumes of reproductions of them. I once worked on them myself for a time, but I, they're outside my present uh, purpose. Oh, one, one of these, I should say on the right, uses the Western technique of modeling the figures uh, in a kind of three-dimensional way. Uh, also, uh, the, the, the way the lattice and the furniture are treated is definitely Westernized, Europeanized. Next, please. I should mention, and this is a subject on which I myself have contributed what I take to be important and others take to be highly controversial writings, uh, how the coming of European prints, mostly religious etchings made in Antwerp and other nor northern European places, 
brought to China by the Jesuit missionaries in the late Ming and early Qing, how these profoundly changed everything in Chinese painting, or at least a lot of it, bringing new styles and new techniques that some Chinese artists and print producers embraced and imitated. But this had little effect on the production of the woodblock pictures that we'll be considering, so again, I won't be bringing it in. One of these European pictures with strongly modeled landscape forms I've used to show uh, some uh, Chinese, how some Chinese painters of the 17th century were heavily affected by them, Gong Shen and others in Nanjing, for instance. Even Dong Chi Chang was affected. I put this in my writings, and Dick Barnhart uh, did an artic article on it. Next, a print from Nadal's Life of Christ, showing Christ healing the leper, strong chiaroscuro, light and shadow, and the modeling of the figures, rendering of distance in the space, all very much Western, all very exciting to the Chinese, visually exciting. People who write about Western influence in Asian art tend to concentrate on linear perspective, an Italian system, but in fact wasn't much used in China, where northern illusionistic techniques such as these uh, had a much more significant effects on Chinese painting and are little noticed by most writers, as I say, on this subject. All this is uh, spelled out at some length in Chapter 3 of my book titled Pictures for Use and Pleasure, so I'm, I won't be ta talking about this here. Next. I could also speak, but I won't on this occasion, about how the introduction of lithography to printing in China in the 19th century profoundly affected the production of picture books and other kinds of uh, pictorial publications there. Uh, if we have lots of sketches pre uh, preserved that were made by artists such as Chen Huian, is the one, the one I'm showing here, made to be reproduced as prints, it's because the original drawing wasn't destroyed when it was used for a lithography print as it would have been for a woodblock print. Uh, in a woodblock print, you pa pasted the original sketch face down onto the wood and used it as a guide for carving and, of course, destroyed it. Um, that's another big and fascinating subject. My old friend Christopher Reed, who used to audit my courses before he went to, before he went to Shanghai to write his thesis, which was turned into a book, has written a whole book about the effect of lithography on Ch and Shanghai printing, mainly in the 19th century. Next. Before we turn to Woodblock printed b pictures proper, I'll speak briefly about another practice that paralleled the invention of printing and was closely related to it, that is the making of ink squeezes or rubbings. Um, these, again, I've talked about in my earlier lectures, but I'll do it just mention them just briefly here. This could be considered a kind of printing, or a predecessor of it, making rubbings, that is, from some engraved or carved design or inscription. Eventually, uh, in, uh, stones would be carved specially for people to make rubbings from them. And there's a great uh, Beilin, or the for forest of, rub of stones in Xi'an, of, of those stones. It's not known just when they were first made, but it probably wasn't long after the invention of paper in China, which is around the middle of the Han Dynasty, close to the beginning of the Christian era with us. The earliest rubbings extant are from the Tang Dynasty and are of calligraphy. I'm showing here images that we showed in the second PRV lecture, the one on Han Dynasty painting and pictorial uh, art. Uh, they are of the stamped tiles that were made for the walls to build the walls of some Han tombs. And then the rubbings from them that show us their designs much more clearly than we could otherwise see them. Next, please. We saw also this photo of the wall of a Sixth Dynasty's tomb near Nanjing, made up of uh, molded or stamped tiles that together made up a design. And a rubbing from it, which reveals that design much better than we otherwise could see it. And it turns out to be a dragon and an immortal, Taoist immortal Shenron, pursuing a magical jade bee disc. Okay, next. This rubbing is usually shown when the great Tang master Wu Daozi is discussed because it's made from a stone engraving that preserves one of his drawings, drawing of a demon. And of course, we don't have any actual painting by Wu Daozi, and so this stone is the best we have. 
in an age when there was no photography and no other kinds of reproduction of what they may, may do with. Next. It can happen that a lost painting is preserved only in a stone engraving or in the rubbings made from one. This is the case with the Wang Chuan Villa paintings made by Wang Wei in the Tang Dynasty, after which stone engravings were made in the early Song, and those in turn inspired, next please, inspired numerous paintings purporting to be Wang Wei's original, but really copied after the rubbings. I talked about these in the lecture on Tang landscape painting. Next please. So this is rubbing from a stone engraving mounted on a pagoda in a temple near Nanjing, representing the Buddha attacked by demons. Uh, and it's a very, very, very famous set of designs. I'll talk about that temple and my own going there and a certain artist who painted there and so on in, again, another lecture. Next, please. Uh, rubbings are also used to reproduce the designs on Chinese uh, archaic bronzes, bronze vessels, bronze vessels, which again cannot be seen easily until you make rubbings from them. So these are among the many, uh, many uses for rubbings. Next, please. Especially frequent and prized are rubbings made of works of calligraphy to preserve these and serve as models for calligraphers to follow. The production of these was a major industry in China, and collections of them are among the treasures of the scholar's studio. We have a very big collection of them in the, our East Asiatic Library at UC Berkeley, bought from the Mitsui family after the Second World War. It's a large and rich collection, but unfortunately it isn't very much used. People don't know about it. Next, please. Large stone tablets engraved with inscriptions carrying historical messages, commemorating some important person or event and so on, are set up all over China and are sought out by scholars who make rubbings from them. As I say, some of these have been collected and moved into a great forest of stones in Xi'an. Anyway, one of these uh, stones appears in a landscape with figures attributed to the 10th century artist Li Chun uh, at Wright, and probably or perhaps based on a painting actually by Li Chun. In any case, I showed this in my lecture on the great masters of the Five Dynasties landscape. Next, please. As for woodblock printing proper, to which we now begin to arrive at Lohast, uh, here are photos of two of the four woodblocks that were brought by Robert Van Gulik in Kyoto. Uh, blocks used for printing late Ming erotic pictures uh, in a famous series. Whether they are the originals, as Van Gulik believed, or Japanese recuttings, as Soren Edgren believes, um, they serve to represent a kind of carved woodblock that was used to print the pictorial images that I'm going to be talking about. Next, please. I myself engaged in a related skill way back in my earlier days, doing linoleum carvings, much easier than woodblock. Ha <laughs> ha! Woodblock is not done not for amateurs, but linoleum carving very definitely is. You can buy the linoleum box and the tools, and use them for printing. I use them for book plates. This is one from my half sister Carol, and it showed her favorite characters from books: the Mad Tea Party from Alice in Wonderland at the top. Uh, the Little Prince at left, the Petit Prince, and Dr. Doolittle at right, and then the characters from the Winnie the Pooh books at the bottom. The other one was used for a uh, postcard announcing my own move from the uh, East Coast to California, 1965, with my family, and it was based on a painting of a Taoist and his family moving, uh, that, uh, moving their residence by the late Ming artist Cui Zhong. This is a rewarding hobby that I recommend to anyone interested in the practice of printing. Next. And now, with all that as preface, we turn to the main matter of this lecture, that is the production in China of pictorial prints of the kind that I take to be works of art and that uh, were in some sense intended as that. Next. I should mention at the outset that an important exhibition of these, with a, a published catalog of which I show the cover here, was held at the British Museum in London from May to September in 2010 with the title The Printed Image in China from the 8th to the 21st Century. Uh, the person mainly behind the project was the German scholar Clarissa von Spee, who has become a curator at the British Museum. 
There was also a symposium with its own publication in which uh, uh, Christopher Underberg, Tom Ebry, whom I'll talk about later, and others took part. So now we will go on to talk about the real matter of this lecture, that is pictorial printing in China.